welcome to the Hero Show, starring the illustrious John Hersey and the irrepressible Andrew Bernstein. I am Andrew Bernstein, and you are indubitably John Hersey. How are you doing today, John? Oh, I'm great. How are you today? I'm rocking and rolling, man. We are ready to discuss one of the illustrious families in, in U.S. revolutionary history, and they, they really are an extraordinarily extraordinary family, aren't they? The entire family is the Adams clan we're talking about. And tomorrow, July 11th, is, of course, the anniversary of the birthday of John Quincy Adams, the guy we're talking about today. The Adams family, and they, they, they used to be a TV show, I don't know, 50 years or so ago, the Adams family, about a, a, this bunch of macabre, you know, kind of ghoulish creatures. And it was, it was, it was, a, it was, a, com it was a comedy. And, and I, as I remember when I was a kid, I thought it was pretty funny at the time. But the, Ad the Adams family we're talking about today is, is, a, is a much more distinguished family of, of people who are, uh, supported individual rights and the American Revolution very strongly. And, and, all, and uh, mother, father, and son, you know, John Adams, Abigail Adams, and John Quincy Adams were all abolitionists, as they should be given uh, American principles of individual rights. Yeah, and, and of course, John Quincy Adams grew up with not one but two extraordinary parents, two of the probably most hot-headed revolutionaries of the entire uh, generation. Uh, grew up when he was a young boy, mostly with Abigail. And John Adams was, of course, making his career and helping jumpstart the revolution. And when, he was, when John Quincy Adams was seven, John Adams went off to the, the first Continental Congress in 74. And he was writing back about, you know, this is what Washington is saying. And this is what Franklin is saying. This is what J Thomas Jefferson is doing. And uh, Abigail is corresponding and reading these letters aloud to the kids. And they're just there uh, absorbing it all. In fact, um, in, in 75, when Quincy Adams was eight, uh, Abigail took them up to Penn's Hill very close to their residence in Braintree, which is now Quincy, Massachusetts. And they saw Charlestown burning and they saw the Battle of Bunker Hill there. So from a very, very young age, John Quincy Adams is just getting this uh, incredible education and in revolutionary principles. Right. That's quite a childhood. And John Quincy Adams doesn't get the recognition that he deserves. So we will, we're, we're going to remediate that today. But uh, I think we should say a few things about his, uh, his illustrious parents here. My, uh, John Adams, of course, one of the leading uh, founders of, of, of this country. His, uh, what were John Adams' dates? Uh, 1735 to 1826, lived to be 90 years, years old. Now, my good, my good friend, Brad Thompson, of course, who's a professor of American history and head of the Clemson Institute of the Study of Capitalism, uh, has written a written a, is an expert on the um, uh, revolutionary period of U.S. history and written a uh, outstanding book on on John Adams and you know and and regards John Adams I think properly as one of the leading founders. We need to remember that that John Adams was a brilliant political thinker and and he wrote the Constitution of of the state of Massachusetts, uh, which has a Declaration of Rights in it that includes freedom of religion and freedom of the press that James Madison later incorporated into the, into the U.S. Bill of Rights. And uh, jo John Adams was properly regarded as an outstanding political scientist. Yeah, I believe at, at the uh, Continental Congress, uh, I don't recall if it was the, first, oh, it was the second Continental Congress in 75, uh, Adams was referred to as the Atlas of Independence. Right. Because he made this outstanding case for declaring independence and, and it wasn't a done deal then a lot of people were on the fence a lot of people didn't want to go to war and guess what war with the the greatest superpower on earth at that time at least the greatest naval power on earth so understandably so but adams won the day and he convinced most people that this was a necessary uh, thing for the colonists to do right i, I believe even before the shot heard around the world right at lexington and concord in april of 1775, Adams already believed that independence was inevitable and, and proper, and he labored in, in the Second Continental Congress to, uh, you know, to, pr to promote independence. And he was the one, John Adams, 
was the one who organized the Committee of Five, uh, placed himself on it, and properly so, along along with Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson. There's a, there's a dream team, you know, <laughs> uh, for you to, to compose the DOI. Uh, uh, what I've read, I, I think Jefferson wanted Adams to, to write it. So Adams was a, a very accomplished political thinker. And Adams said, no, you're, you're 10 times better writer than I am, Tom. You know, uh, you do it. And, and Adams was a very strong, you're, you're right, John, there were still a lot of people, you know, in the, in the Second Continental Congress who, who, who did not favor revolution and independence. And understandably so, like you said, going to war with Great Britain, very dicey proposition, and they were still, you know, British subjects, and had had and had certain advantages from from being uh, part of uh, you know of Great Britain. Uh, but Adams labored long and hard in in the Second Continental Congress to gain support for the Declaration of Independence. And I think Thomas Jefferson said later that the the, the Declaration wouldn't have uh, wouldn't have passed, it wouldn't have you know had the influence it did, uh, except for Adams' brilliant, hot tempered feisty guy, you know, fighting for it in the, you know, on the, on the floor of Congress day after day. Absolutely. So that's, that's one parent. And then there's Abigail who right, extremely right. well read can quote all sorts of classical literature from memory. Uh, it, very, very interested in the revolution and in the principles of the revolution. She was when John Quincy was seven, I believe she was reading to him from Charles Robinson's or having him read Charles Robinson's, uh, history of, of the ancient uh, ancient Greece, in which there are all sorts of morality tales about tyrants being put down. Yeah, yeah Abigail Adams was an extraordinary woman. Her, her dates were uh, 1744 to 1818. And in the 18th century, and, and, and continuing after the 18th century, and unfortunately continuing in many parts of the world to this day, Women weren't supposed to, you know, girls growing up were not supposed to get this kind of education. I mean, to this day, our good friends, the Taliban in Afghanistan, will put a bullet in a woman's head for the crime of getting an education. Uh, now, in, in the West, it was never that extreme, but but there was still this, you know, the, this conventional stricture against against it. And Abigail had very little formal schooling, but she was taught by her mother and her grandmother. Her father had a vast library that that she took advantage of, and she is considered probably the most erudite woman to ever serve as first lady, you know, in, in the in, in the White House. And uh, John Adams during his presidency, uh, late 18th century, late 1790s, John Adams so relied on her judgment that his political political opponents not only claimed that she was his real cabinet, but they used to refer to her as Mrs. President. <laughs> so, i love that yeah it's great it's great so you're right i mean john quincy i mean you couldn't have two more brilliant parents you know who who was so devoted to individual rights and personal liberties than than john than john quincy had absolutely and so he's under his mother's uh education his mother's upbringing until uh what seven years old uh 11 rather 11 he his father is stationed in Paris, and John Quincy goes with him, of course. Their way over there is quite the adventure. They spot the perils of podcasting with dogs. My dog wants to dig over here. Well, he uh, wants to he wants to get in on you know honoring the Adams family. You, know, you can't can't blame him for that. He figures, you know, more liberty means more milk bones. So I mean he has a good <laughs> practical you know, perspective on this issue. Smart guy. Right. right. So under the communists, the dogs get eaten. <laughs> you know, <laughs> under the capitalists, they get fed. It's, it's quite a, that's a life and death difference. Yeah. He's a big fan of John Quincy Adams. So as well, he might be. Quincy Adams and, and his father, of course, were being chased by these. Uh, well, they, they spotted three British warships and one pursued them. And uh, they, they escaped only to be met with a ridiculous thunderstorm. John Adams wrote on what little dry paper he could find that him and his son had to do all they can. They had to use their arms and legs to try to hold themselves into their bunks, keep themselves from falling out. And he quickly realized that, yeah, I kind of thought this might be dangerous. Maybe this isn't so good of an idea, but nonetheless, they, they did make it to Paris. Yeah, that, 
Yeah, that's good. How old was John Quincy during, during this adventure that his father was, dragged him on? He was 11 on their first trip. And they, so they went in 78. Not much happened. They came back and went again in 1780. And this time he brought both his sons, John Quincy and Charles Francis Adams. And um, for a time they were enrolled in really good schools in Paris. And then uh, they, they moved to uh, the Netherlands. And uh, John Quincy was put into school he stationed him at the university of leiden one of the greatest universities in the world at that time and he's he's there 13 years old uh in this university and his father is writing to him he's, his father just stations there him there and leaves uh he's writing to him asking him about the the greatest teachers there uh asking him to write back a, about the basically the intellectual life of leiden and uh quincy adams is is making more childish requests and uh you know he he wants to be a kid but he he's given this very adult education at a very very young age well hopefully he had he found some fun moments uh at leiden kid, kids will usually find their way that to, to have fun especially when mom and dad you know are uh, you know are not nearby but certainly he went on to have a, a extraordinary career that doesn't gain enough recognition i i think you know as as a diplomat as generally considered the greatest secretary of state to ever uh you know, that, that 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 ever lived in this country uh one-term president of the united states uh the thing that's extraordinary to me is, is after a, after his presidency ended he didn't like, you know, fade off into the sunset you know and assume an elder statesman role but he he, he served in, in the House of Representatives in the U.S. Congress for 18 years until his death. And of course, as an abolitionist, I think we need to discuss all of those, you know, all of those achievements uh, today. Absolutely. Yeah, his, his political career got started very early. Uh, shortly after his stay at Leiden, he was called away by a, a family friend, Francis Dana, who had been uh, appointed minister to Russia and asked John Quincy Adams to come be his secretary and translator. So 14 years old, and he's translating official documents from one minister to another in the, in the Russian capital, learning, uh, the, he's really learning the post that he would later take not too long later in uh, 17, uh, let's see, 1796, when his father took the presidency, he would station John Quincy Adams there in Russia. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how many different uh, roles that John Quincy uh, performed, an outstanding diplomat. Uh, one of his um, one of his great successes uh, as a diplomat was uh, was you know, helping to negotiate the peace treaty that ended the War of 1812. Right, I think um, uh, James Madison was 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 president then, and uh, Quincy Adams had a, a you know outstanding contribution to that to that peace negotiate peace negotiations. Absolutely. The Treaty of Ghent, uh, you know, still a young man. And he apparently led this commission to to negotiate the peace. And again, we're talking about a, a fledgling nation who's only recently won its independence that had just fought the greatest naval power on earth. So uh, to negotiate a return to the status quo before the war, which is what happened, the negotiated said, you keep your territory, we'll keep our territory, we'll just go back to the way it was. Uh, Congress considered that a huge, and the American, the American public considered that a huge victory to have right. fought and, and not have been ground into the dust by this massive naval power. Right, right. Britain, Britannia ruled the waves, right? I mean, they had the vast colonial empire, even after they lost most of their North American colonies, they had the, the, the mighty navy. And the, uh, the peace treaty that resolved the War of 1812 was, was negotiated and signed before the Battle of New Orleans, right before Andrew Jackson's uh, forces defeated these British, these, these British regulars, many of whom were, were seasoned veterans of fighting Napoleon in Europe. But was, even before that victory, the, the, the British evidently ha had enough of, of fighting these, um, these American upstarts they had the same, you know, the American coastline, of course, is is vast, and the U.S. seafaring power, even 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 early on, had the same kind of uh, successful tradition that the British had, and it's not an accident. The United States, the United States went on to be the greatest naval uh, 
uh, na naval power in the world. And, and this was really the only, the only foe who could match the, the British uh, Navy on, on the high seas. And, 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 and you're right, it was a great achievement to, uh, to, to battle the mighty British Empire to a naval standstill. Yep. Shortly after this, uh, Monroe makes him Secretary of State, as you mentioned. And one of the first uh, things he tackles in that position is to negotiate very fiercely with both uh, Spanish and French ministers for the U.S. to take over the Floridas. It was the Florida, the state of Florida that we know today, the territory immediately to the west of that, which is Arkansas today. And uh, ruthlessly negotiates and gets everything he wants for America. Even his his cabinet uh, apparently was uh, telling him to back off. You know, we're, we're I think we've got enough. Uh, I think we can. And, and no way, we're gonna t we're gonna take it all. Yeah, right, 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 right. James Monroe, of course, uh, president of the United States. Monroe was POTUS at that time, continuing the Virginia aristocracy, the uh, you know the presidency of of Virginia slave owners uh, of of uh, you know, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, James Monroe, interrupted solely by the Adams family. Right, the Virginia Absolutely. aristocracy was interrupted by John Adams, uh, second president between uh, Washington and Jefferson, and then uh, John Quincy Adams, uh, who was, was he the fifth president or the sixth? I lost, I lost track, but he was uh, following sixth. James, sixth? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sixth. So you're, you're Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, Quincy Adams, right. He's the, he's the sixth, pre he's sixth POTUS, and uh, effectively puts an end to the Virginia aristocracy, although, uh, Andrew Jackson, who follows him, is also a slave owner and, 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 a, and, and a slave supporter. But you're right. You're right, John. Adams, uh, Adams ne ne negotiations, even called the Adams Owners Treaty, isn't it? It uh, is. Quincy Adams' name is on it because he so forcefully negotiated with the Spaniards who still had, you know, this, this empire in the, in, in the Western Hemisphere, you know, still in, you know, Mexico and South America and in Florida, on you know, on the North American continent, and gained the state of Florida for uh, the United States. So that's one of his his second great uh, diplomatic triumph, and first one as as Secretary of State in the Monroe administration. Yeah, and I believe it was as part of that deal that he also got the Spaniards to release any claims to the, the western side of the United States. So what was called then the Oregon, Oregon Territory, and. Uh, this is really the first time in U.S. history that America became a continental nation. He had foreseen this happening, and, and so had previous uh, presidents and secretaries of state, and they really wanted it. And guess who made it happen? John Quincy Adams. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, before, before this, of course, <clears throat> excuse me, President Thomas Jefferson had uh, negotiated with Napoleon to gain the, the Louisiana Purchase. And of course, mm -hmm. there's the, the famed Lewis and Clark expedition to explore. I mean, it's, it's really amazing. You got this vast continent uh, is unexplored by Europeans or, or Americans. Well, anyway, now it's ours. Now, now let's, let's go figure out what we, what, we, what we have here. But right, John Quincy Adams was a, was a strong supporter of that. And of course, eventually, um, uh, the, the Monroe Doctrine, which is, which is a powerful piece of uh, diplomacy on the part of a fledgling republic, you know, standing up to these European powers who had colonized the Western Hemisphere for centuries, and Quincy Adams' um, uh, work and 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 his, his handiwork is all over the Monroe Doctrine. I mean, he's he's credited with with the with this with these claims uh, even more than President James Monroe, although Monroe's name is. <laughs> Yeah, the uh, a lot of the Spanish and, and Portuguese colonies in South America were declaring independence and calling themselves republics in sort of in the shadow of the U.S. And Henry Clay, Speaker of the House, a very uh, influential figure, wanted America to dive in on the side of these fledgling republics and basically uphold uh, these uh, uh, these new governments and. Adams, Quincy Adams said, you know, we are but interested spectators. Uh, we don't want to necessarily go in and try to help prop up these countries. We don't, we don't want to get involved, but we also don't want 
European nations to think that they can come over here into our sphere of influence and p- potentially threaten us. So. Right, right, right. And not get involved in these foreign affairs. There's a continuation of Washington's principles and you know, his, in his farewell address, not get involved in foreign wars, I mean, especially on the European continent. But you know, the principle can be extended further, not get involved in foreign wars. Now, that's easier said than done in a world where warfare is just you know, endless and, and ubiquitous. But you can understand Quincy Adams' uh, uh, principles here. And here under Monroe and, and Quincy Adams, here's this still this very, this, this very young American republic standing up to, the, to these European powers and, 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 and telling them, stay home. You know, your days of colon- stay on your own side of the pond. Your days of colonizing the Western Hemisphere are done. You can imagine some of these, you know, these Euro- these European kings say, "Who, who are these guys? <laughs> who did they just they just you know came into existence as a, as a new country? Who, who do they think they are? They're telling us, you know, we we can't col- We have these colonies for centuries. The Spaniards had colonized, you know, Latin and South America for for centuries, and here and here's this nascent republic saying. Stay out of stay out of our sphere of influence. Leave these nascent republics alone. Uh, and you know, Americans flexing their muscles here and doing it properly on the side of greater freedom and less and less imperialism. You know, you know that that like you said, John, the, these country the the revolutionary spirit was sweeping across uh, Latin America and, and South America, and a number of these Spanish colonies were declaring their independence. And here and here's the U.S. government. Uh, you know, supporting that. So that's, you know, so I think that's a, a, a the Monroe Doctrine in that regards, authored largely by Secretary of State John Quincy Adams is a, is a great achievement in, in support of, uh, of freedom. Yeah, it takes a lot of its substance from a, a speech that Quincy Adams gave on July 4th, 1821. At this point it was already into Monroe's second term and Quincy Adams knew that he would be running for president again, or that he himself would run for president next. And this is really how things had fallen. Every previous secretary of state had become president. It was sort of like you're next in line, you're on the bench. And uh, you got to remember too, that earlier in his career, when he was just a lowly lawyer back in Boston, uh, he gained the attention of George Washington by writing in defense of his, his stance of American neutrality in the British and French wars. So he has long thought, John Quincy Adams has long been on the side of, hey, let's not have this aggressive foreign policy where we're trying to uh, be some imperialist nation. The government is here to do one thing, protect our rights, and it can do that best when we're not meddling in foreign affairs. So yeah, in this speech, he, he makes these points, not so, uh, not, not, not so explicitly as I've just done, but uh, makes these points and really changes a lot of minds and changes Monroe's mind. Monroe, uh, he wasn't totally in Clay's camp, but he wanted to make a joint statement with with Britain. And Quincy Adams said, no, we've got to make this statement alone. And that alone will send the message to these European nations that they shouldn't be you know, sending their ships over here and, and trying to uh, colonize this, this uh, hemisphere. Right. Right. This hemisphere is off limits to European imperialism. <laughs> it's the, this tiny little, I mean, geographically it's vast, but, you know, in terms of, in terms of its history, its tradition, its naval and military power, you know, it's a, it's a panty waste, you know, nation standing up to these heavyweight European powers, Britain, France, Spain, you know, telling them, stay on your own side of the pond. I mean, it's a, it's a gutsy thing to do. It's supporting freedom. And, you know, and I think, you know, I wish to say th- something about the long-term consequences of the Washington Quincy Adams principles here, you know, staying out of uh, foreign affairs. Um, contrary to, to Marxist, crit- you know, later on Marxist criticisms of this country, I don't know historically if there's ever been a nation as powerful as the United States is th- that had so, so little military imperialism in its history. I mean, you know, the, uh, the country takes over the Philippines, you know, and then, you know, and, and, and there's, the, there's the American empire, right? It was the Philippines. Uh, it was, but, you know, defeats Japan in World War II, thank God, builds the country up and then leaves, you know, in Japan now, because very prosperous uh, nation, builds Germany, helps build Germany up with the Marshall Plan after World War II, and then, and then, and then gets out, you know, contrary to the Soviets, you know, who, who 
conquered you know Eastern and Central Europe and 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 built a uh, and, and built an empire. The Americans out, and I could criticize American foreign policy going on you know endlessly, like Vietnam, the Vietnam War, for example. But there, the goal was to stop communism. You know, uh, the South Vietnamese regime was a brutal dictatorship, but they're Boy Scouts compared to communists. So it was in support of of less dictatorship, you know, uh, rather than rather than more. But you know the get stay out of these foreign wars. Don't you know? Don't establish uh, an empire. Support freedom. And I think uh, relative to the other mighty powers uh, of history, uh, the United States track record on on this has been very good. And I think you know Washington set the set the term terms for that. Quincy Adams supported it. And I think you know I think their legacy uh, is 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 ongoing and enormously positive. Yeah, largely untarnished, although, you know, during Quincy Adams' lifetime, this is in the period, I believe, when he was then after the presidency, we'll, we'll have to do some backtracking, but after the presidency, he became, of course, a representative for the state of Massachusetts and opposed the Mexican War and the annexation of Texas, which he saw as a blatant violation of the Monroe Doctrine, and it was. Uh, and extending slavery. Exactly. And, and this goes back to something that happened while he was still Secretary of State. We ought to talk about the Missouri question, Missouri compromise that came from that. Okay. The, the Missouri compromise. That's uh, obviously a, a, back in the day, John, when they used to teach American history in the, you know, in the, in the high schools, the Missouri compromise of course was, uh, was studied. I vaguely remember studying it in my, Amer my AP American history class in high school before they kicked me out of it. Uh, <laughs> you know, you'll be glad to know I was kicked out of all the AP and honors and HB classes uh, in high school because I was a troublemaker. But that's another story for, 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 for another day. So where you so the Missouri Compromise and John Quincy Adams. So what, what, what do you what do you remember about about that? So in 1820, uh, there comes this question, and the uh, question is, do we allow Missouri uh, to become a, a, a slave state? So up until this time, there's a clear line between North and South between free and slave. And Missouri was this vast territory that it, it overlapped the border. And so it threatened to really disrupt this system, this uh, you know, evil system nonetheless, but a system for trying to contain slavery, at least to the South. And this is still, well, Adams is Secretary of State, and he isn't really engaged in any of the con congressional debates, of course, but they do discuss this in the cabinet and the cabinet is John Adams, uh, very much opposed to slavery and every other person in Monroe's cabinet was a slave owner. Uh, the most probably astute and vocal of which John C. Calhoun, who would go on to become the champion of slavery, the pamphleteer of the cause. And uh, they had a, they had a good working relationship, Quincy Adams and Calhoun and discussed this at length and <laughs> Calhoun, you know, Quincy Adams said, there's this thing, the Declaration of, the, of Independence. Right. Uh, all Did people. hear of it? Did hear of a big yeah. guy? <laughs> <laughs> all people are born with these rights. We, we have these inalienable rights. I mean, what, what argument do you have against this? And Calhoun says, well, you know, where I come from, we think this South is Carolina, right? Yeah. Right. South Carolina, this applies only to white people. And Adams uh, has this this recognition, he, he recognizes, well, if slavery can just so distort and corrupt a, a very smart person's mind, it obviously corrupts human nature in general. It's just this evil thing. Yeah. And, and, and Calhoun's an interesting case because everybody, his worst enemies acknowledge he was a brilliant political theorist. You know, uh, I spent a year at Clemson University in, in South Carolina, great year, I might add, and Calhoun's house is on is on the campus. And, you know, he's, he, he's still admired. Uh, but, you know, he was uh, an avid supporter of slavery. And it's just it's such a contradiction. Uh, it's in, slavery, of course, has what Quincy Adams, you know, his 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 mother and father were both outspoken abolitionists. You know, John and Abigail Adams were both uh, opposed to slavery. And he, he grew up in that atmosphere and understands the, the principle of individual rights. 
and Quincy Adams opposes it, it too. But the you know, history of slavery is, is vast. I mean, as Thomas Sowell points out, it's existed all over the world, going back in, in, into prehistory. In the 18th century, which is you know, the, the, the century in which Quincy Adams is born, um, the, it's only the beginning of an abolitionist movement, and, and, and first only in, in Great Britain, uh, based on the, on, the, on the Lockean principles uh, of individual rights. So this was a revolution, this idea you know, that uh, all human beings, I mean, I mean, it was a revolution just to, just to start baby steps, right? We, we, mankind advances with baby steps, just to start with the idea that white men have rights, uh, they don't belong, their life doesn't belong to the king, but then to expand it universally to all human beings, either gender, all races, tribes, nationalities. This is an ongoing struggle because slavery still exists, you know, legally, you know, I mean, it exists here, but it's illegal. You know, se the sex trafficking, for example, is a, is a form of slavery. But in, in Sudan, uh, they, the, the Sudanese government might have, you know, might have have a fig leaf of uh, opposition to slavery. But there's tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of black, uh, largely Christians enslaved by that Islamic nation. And let's not forget, Islam sanctions the enslavement of, of infidels, you know, of, uh, of non-believers. North Korea, any communist nation, God knows how much, you know, slave labor in, in China, any communist nation. So this is an ongoing struggle that Quincy Adams was involved in to end the evil institution of uh, human slavery and the abolitionist movement based on the Lockean Jeffersonian principle of individual rights, even though Jefferson himself was a slave owner and Locke at, at some point in his career, uh, I think, I think uh, supported, supported it. But uh, it's an ongoing revolution, John, and uh, Quincy Adams is, is one of its heroes, especially when we get to the Amistad case in, you know, in a few minutes. Yeah, and, and we've got to remember how radical abolition was at this time. Uh, of course, the international slave trade had been outlawed that had nothing that had really no bearing on slavery in the United States. And what did was uh, Great Britain's outlawing of slavery, you know, the, the great battle by William Wilberforce in, in the parliament. And that, that sort of mentality caught, caught on here in the U.S., but even in the North, lots of people thought that these abolitionists were these crazy extremist radicals. Very, very few congressmen would feel comfortable questioning slavery at all. And John Quincy Adams uh, really had spent up to this point, most of his career focused on foreign policy. He spent all this time in Europe as a minister, uh, then comes back and as secretary of state. And he's focused on some internal affairs, as, we, as we've talked about. But primarily these, these uh, non-racial uh, issues. So now in 1820, the Missouri Compromise, he, he doesn't really have to play a part in this, but it reactivates his thinking, so to speak, and, um, and, and has a huge bearing on what's to come for John Quincy Adams. Uh, right, right. And the, str the, struggle, the struggle for individual rights, freedom, to end slavery, to end tyranny, it's ongoing. It, uh, I don't want to sound pessimistic here, but at this point, there's no end in sight. Like I said, this slavery is legal. Uh, Islam, we, got, we have to, you know, acknowledge the ugly truths. You can't, uh, under Islam, you cannot enslave a co-religionist, but everybody else is fair game. Uh, and uh, under communism, of course, in North Korea and, uh, and, and elsewhere, if you're an enemy of the, you know, and China, if you're an enemy of the state, if you're deemed an enemy of the state by the state, then you know your your life is forfeit, and you you will be you know sent to a gulag at at best. You might be executed, but you know you could you will certainly be sent to a gulag and you know and and enforced uh, forced in, into slavery. So this is you know and and you know tyrannies of all types, secular and religious, exist all over the world. So this ongoing struggle for individual rights, there's uh, there's no end in sight. Um, uh, with Quincy Adams himself strong support of individual rights. His, his revolutionary pedigree is impeccable, right, given his, uh, uh, the accomplishments of his parents. And he, become, he and his dad become the first father-son combo to, to be POTUS, right, to be president of the United States. And we don't even want to mention the, the second one, you know, too much, you know, the, the Bush clan. <laughs> 
But uh, the Adams family, of course, is a lot more illustrious than Big Bush and Little Bush or Shrub, as I like to uh, think of it. <laughs> Shrub. But uh, even so, but even so, uh, the way the way John Quincy Adams became president is is is, is a is a great story you know, in and of itself. The controversy with Andrew Jackson and 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 um, and, the, and Henry Clay. Yeah, and it's a story that really cast a shadow over his entire presidency. And I think uh, was part of the reason he really didn't get much done as president. Um, you know, he, he was secretary of state. He was next in line. He had he'd done, it had more high level government positions than anyone else in history. Um, and he, he thought he had earned the presidency. But when the popular vote came in, he was second to Andrew Jackson, this illustrious war hero from the South. Uh, you know, uh, uh, very much uh, an imperialist and, and into or supportive of slavery. Um, and so this thing gets kicked into the House of Representatives. This, you know, the 12th Amendment requires that if uh, the election is not decided, that it be voted on among the representatives and they would have to choose from the top three candidates. So yeah, that, you know, and that became a, a, a debacle and a, and, a, and a wrangle in the, you know, in, in the House. Uh, Henry Clay eventually throws his support behind Quincy Adams rather than Andrew Jackson. The whole story of that, of, you know, implied uh, or alleged corruption. Uh, Andrew Jackson yells, I was robbed. And, uh, uh, you know, and he begins his camp. He begins his campaign for the presidency. You know, right from the time that that Quincy, you know, for the next election, which is what eighteen twenty eight, uh, right from the time that uh, Quincy Adams is is inaugurated. So uh, Jackson, like you said, is a popular war hero. Jackson's got a lot of flaws. There's no no doubt about that. But he's a popular war hero, especially in the South. He's a slave supporter from ten from Tennessee, and he's got a lot of support in the South. That can't, you know, you're right. It, it, it casts a pall over uh, uh, Quincy Adams' one term as, as president. And uh, because uh, many, many people in the country, especially in the South, su supported Andrew Jackson's campaign for the presidency for, the, for, the, for those years when Quincy Adams himself was president. Yeah. So uh, um, Jackson claimed that Clay and Adams schemed that Clay would take all of his support and put it behind Adams and Clay, I believe, was from Kentucky. He was a right. congressman from Kentucky. Kentucky, guess how many votes Kentucky had cast for Adams? How many? Zero. Yet he convinced uh, a majority of, of the representatives from Kentucky to vote for Adams. So Adams ends up getting Kentucky's one vote. And Clay apparently persuades some others to vote for Adams as well, throws all the support behind Adams. And shortly after, Adams uh, appoints Clay his Secretary of State. So yeah, Andrew this doesn't Jackson, look good. This doesn't pass the smell test. You know, even in politics and you know, and dirty business uh, goes on all the time. This doesn't pass the smell test. Even though you know, Henry Clay, you know, had a lot of juice in in Congress and was a very able person and very qualified to be Secretary of State. It looks bad. And of course, uh, Andrew Jackson yelled foul. And, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people agreed with him. And the election of 1828 was a huge victory for Jackson, wasn't it? Yeah, it ended up making John Quincy the uh, only the second one term president in history, the first being his father, who lost, of course, to Thomas Jefferson. Right. Another, another, you know, ugly debacle i mean you know you, you know when you read joseph ellis's book founding brothers and you realize these guys weren't brothers you know they, they very <laughs> often they uh, the american founders were brilliant and they they accomplished great things but they didn't like each other you know in, in many cases and you know we think politics is dirty today with with trump as president and all the the verbal abuse that gets spewed back and forth. These guys today are Boy Scouts compared to the 1790s, you know, and the, the name calling and just the, the, the mudslinging. And Thomas <laughs> Jefferson, unfortunately, is, you know, is very culpable here, you know, hiring scandal mongers to write, you know, anti Adams, you know, screeds against uh, you know, his, his, uh, uh, his Federalist enemies, including 
President John Adams. And, and Adams and Jefferson, who had been such you know, colleagues and allies in the, in, the, in, in the writing of the Declaration of Independence and the quest for independence from Great Britain became bitter political enemies, the Federalists versus, you know, the Republicans uh, at the turn of the, of, of the 19th century, bitter, you know, acrimonious political enemies. They didn't speak or contact each other for years after Adams left, uh, you know, John Adams Sr. Left the, left the White House, uh, although they reconciled later and had a lengthy correspondence for years before, before their death. And I got to point out, John, the, the, <laughs> you can't make this stuff up, right? I mean, Adams was, John Adams Sr. is 90 when he dies. Uh, Thomas Jefferson is 83 and or in his in his uh, 80s and they had a, like a little wager going as to who would outlive the <laughs> other they die not only on the same day but on july 4th 1826 50 years to the day that the declaration of independence was signed you can't make this up if you wrote this in a novel people would say that's too far fetched <laughs> you know they say truth is stranger than than, than fiction and John Adams on his deathbed reportedly said Thomas Jefferson still lives, not realizing this is, you know, 1826, there's no internet, you know, yeah. not realizing that several hours before Thomas Jefferson had, had passed away. It's, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Um, but piece of good news here is that John Adams lived to see his son become president of the United States. Abigail had passed away a few years before that. She did not live to see her son become president, but his father, his father did. He does. He sees him become president and he sees him suffer many of the things that he suffered. Uh, uh, just bitter. Lings and uh, arrows criticism. of outrageous fortune. <laughs> <laughs> bitter criticism. And, and to be fair, John Quincy Adams really had some pretty poor ideas and some poor initiatives as president. He wanted uh, to support Henry Clay's uh, system he called it the American system and it was a system of internal improvements he wanted to spend federal money to uh, create roads and bridges and canals and uh, harbors and got very little done um, one of the things that you know he traveled Europe and he'd seen that European countries have these observatories these the, the astronomical observatories and just to give you an idea of the level of criticism he said you know these things, are, are lighthouses of the sky and really uh, useful things to have. We can gain lots of knowledge from erecting one for ourselves. And that, of course, got turned uh, in, into the news spin of the day into lighthouses in the sky. <laughs> and people were making fun of this apparently crazy guy who wanted to spend the, the nation's money on creating lighthouses in the sky. Right. Wanted, uh... Right. Right. You know, and then this is a quasi. Uh, like you said, it's influenced by uh, European monarchs who control the economy, the, the old mercantilist uh, you know, aristocratic system, and becomes a template for later socialists. Who just people who are just enamored of government power and think government can get things done uh, uh, more effectively than can private initiative. Uh, so you know, uh, yeah, the American system is a this quasi. Uh, socialist uh, system and contradicts Quincy Adams' general commitment to, to individual rights. But, um, you know, we, we show, so we see, so we see he's a lackluster president, as you put it, when, when we were discussing this yesterday, as a one-term uh, president, but his great achievements we've already seen as a diplomat and as secretary of state, but he goes on to further achievements uh, after uh, he serves in the White House because he doesn't, you know, fade off into the into the sunset like, uh, you know, retired presidents uh, have have so often done. He serves in the House of Representatives for, uh, from the state of Massachusetts for 18 years and, and, until his death. And one of the things he got done in the House was he he was able to re get, he led the charge to repeal this law. That, that prevented uh, discussion and debate of the slavery issue on the House floor. So that you know that that's a that's a step forward. Again, we met, we advance in baby steps, and that's a step forward in the in the quest for human liberty. Yeah, he was asked if he might uh, run for the House of Representatives. Of course, every president, his father included, had served and then retired. And uh, you know, someone said, "Well, I, this." This it's not demeaning to you, right, to, to serve in the House of Representatives. And he said, well, uh, if people wanted me to, I would serve as town selectman. 
I don't care. I will serve my country. So uh, right, right. That's noble. Be noble that in the cause of liberty, you know, the, the in the in the in the cause of uh, upholding the republic against these monarchs in in uh, Europe, which is you know part of the Monroe Doctrine, and of course the opposition to slavery, which contradicts every uh, principle that that this country was was founded on. And it was when he was serving in, in Congress that the famed Amistad case took place, which was, you know, uh, if, if people don't know about it, that the movie in the, in the late uh, 1990s, I think it was Spielberg. I think Spielberg directed it, didn't he? Uh, Amistad with uh, Morgan Freeman and, uh, and Anthony Hopkins plaguing John Quincy Adams. Great choice, uh, great cast. And the Amistad case, of course, really uh, showcases Quincy Adams uh, individual rights principles, his abolitionist stance, because he was not an outspoken, you know, fiery abolitionist like Frederick Douglass or uh, William Lloyd Garrison. And he certainly wasn't, you know, uh, John Brown, who was ready to, you know, the, to go to war over over this issue. But um, we saw we, we he was but in private, he was certainly like his parents. He was certainly an abolitionist. And we see him arguing for, for the freedom of the Amistad slaves in that in that uh, in, in in a case that went all the way to SCOTUS, right, all the way to the Supreme Court. Yeah, his his entry back into uh, racial politics in America came, like you said, with a gag rule, and he he was there at the very beginning, and and uh, he was sort of needling the South, and their response to his his needling them was to pass this gag rule because what happened was. Uh, lots of people, there were thousands of petitions were coming in to repeal slavery in the District of Columbia. The Congress did not have, by the, by the Constitution, did not have the power supposedly to uh, repeal slavery in the South, but it could do so in the District of Columbia. Uh, so lots of petitions were coming in. And what happened was the South said, this is ridiculous. Uh, this Congress doesn't have the ability to to uh, dictate whether or not there will be slavery in the District of Columbia, which it in fact did. Uh, and so they said, we ought to table and get rid of and not accept any petition that comes in on this issue. And John Adams said, no, that, that's absolutely wrong. Uh, we have, people have a constitutional right to petition their elected representatives, and we have to read these petitions. And he found every means he could to do so. So, uh, you know, they they passed this gag rule, and he <clears throat> shortly after that he uh, he says, well, he he argues we ought we we certainly should be able to read the petitions that came in before the passing of this rule. This rule can't be uh, enacted retroactively. And the, the South, the majority of people, said yes, it can. So he lost that battle. He, he then started reading the petitions from people from other states because the gag rule apparently didn't outlaw him from doing that uh, when, when they put the kibosh on that as well. He began reading the petitions sent to him by women because women couldn't vote at this point. And so he was allowed by the gag rule to read their peti petitions. Uh, he, he later changed it to black women. And then what really infuriated the Southerners was he asked if he could, if, if he was allowed by this rule to read petitions uh, against slavery in, in DC from enslaved people. He said, can I read this petition wow. from 22 enslaved people? And uh, Waddy Thompson, he, he moved to censure John Adams and to just basically keep him from, from going any, any, uh, making any more progress on this issue. And Adams alone uh, stood up and he, he leveraged the fact that he was given the opportunity to defend himself by house rules to continue to lambast them about this issue of slavery and, and to fight for abolition. And he forced his colleagues to consider what this precedent would mean of, uh, of censuring their colleagues for speaking. We're, we live in a country based on individual rights and key among those is the right to speak one's mind. Can you really censure a politician for speaking in the House of Representatives? And uh, finally, argument after argument, he, he 
pushed them back and in 1844 finally got them to repeal this gag rule. And in the midst of that is this Amistad case. Right. And yeah. Yeah. The Amistad case that was um, uh, in violation of the laws against the slave trade, the, 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 the United States, uh, I think in 1808, uh, President Thomas Jefferson had, uh, you know, Congress passed the laws ag uh, against the slave trade, which is a step towards uh, banning slavery, signed in into, into law, interestingly, by a slave owner, President Thomas Jefferson. But Jefferson theoretically was a lifelong abolitionist. Um, and uh, anyway, 1839, the Amistad, a Spanish ship, uh, has slaves from, from Africa, I think from present day Sierra Leone, uh, on, on, the, on the way to Cuba. There's a slave uprising, right? They take control of the ship. Uh, the slaves want to go home, understandably so, you know, and the, but the, the I think they killed the ship captain in the uprising, mm -hmm. but, but the, 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 these, these guys didn't know how to, how to sail a vessel. They weren't seamen. And, and so the, the, uh, the, the seamen said, well, well, yeah, okay, we'll take you back to Africa, but they actually sailed up the coast of North America and were eventually seized by a U.S. Navy or, or a Coast Guard vessel. And then they erupts the court cases, 1839. You know, uh, are they slaves? Are they not slaves? If they're slaves, who do they belong to? The Spaniards were in violation of, of American, signat of American you know, signatories to the uh, anti-slave trade. Uh, you know, and there's several court cases. One of them about the status of the slaves. Are they free men uh, or are they slaves? Goes all the way to SCOTUS. Right to the Supreme Court of the United States. Uh, this is uh, 1843, so Quincy Adams is in his 70s, and the abolitionists, a, a, a former president of the United States, you, you, you know, a, a sitting U.S. congressman uh, from Massachusetts, and the abolitionists hire Quincy Adams to plead. Uh, before the Supreme Court for the freedom, uh, the proper freedom of, of, of these slaves against the U.S. government. Uh, was Van Buren, I think, was president then, mm -hmm. who's from New York, but had a, you know, had a lot of supporters in the South um, and uh, had been a crony of Andrew Jackson, if I remember my American history. And the um, U.S. government's position was we have a treaty with Spain that supersedes all other considerations. So these these, these uh, black Africans, one are slaves and two belong to the Spaniards and have to be returned to Spain. And must have been a great. I never saw the movie. I got to I, I have to see it. I'm sure I'm sure Spielberg did a good job presenting this. But according to real historical uh, fact, John Quincy Adams stands up, you know, in, be before SCOTUS and the Declaration of Independence is on the wall, you know, and Quincy Adams points to the to the DOI facing the judges points to the DOI and says, quote, I know no law, no statute, no treaty, except that law pointing to the Declaration of Independence, which is forever before the eyes of your honors, unquote, arguing explicitly for uh, individual rights, uh, uh, liberty against the slave trade. And of course, the abolitionists and Quincy, oh, by the way, he, uh, he was known, Quincy Adams was known then as old man eloquent. You know, he was in his 70s when, when he's arguing uh, uh, before SCOTUS on, on the Amistad case. And, and he wins the case, right? The, the slaves are, are freed as they, as they properly should be. And based on money that is hired from various uh, abolitionist organizations and churches, they're able to take ship uh, back to their original home in Africa. And he just delights in this criticism that he'll always be remembered, the, the Southern Democrats say, as the acutest, the astutest, and the archest enemy of Southern slavery that ever existed. Well, that's, yeah, that's something to be proud of. Uh, you know, I, I, if I were Quincy Adams, I'd put that on my tombstone. <laughs> you, 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 you know, if I have enemies like these, I must be doing something right. You know, my enemies say this about me, that I must be doing some, something right. So... Uh, yeah, Quincy Adams doesn't get, I think, the recognition in American history that he deserves, probably because his one term in, in the presidency was, you know, was, was uh, ill-fated and, and lackluster, good adjective that you ascribe to it. But his accomplishments in so many other areas, you know, as a diplomat, as secretary of state, uh, as a U.S. congressman, as, a, as an abolitionist, are, are so uh, outstanding that uh, even... even um, but aside from his lineage, you know, his, his revolutionary uh, credentials, 
from his both his parents, he stands out, you know, as a, as a legitimate hero. Uh, like you said, his birthday is tomorrow, so it's perfect timing for us. And I like to think that his two brilliant revolutionary parents would have been proud, you know, of their son's career. I think they absolutely would have been. Absolutely. He, uh, as, as one biographer called him, he was a militant spirit. James Traub has this uh, moniker for him. And he really was. I mean, he stood up alone when he knew something was right. It didn't matter if it was his party or, or another. Uh, he always was willing to sacrifice his popularity for the cause that he thought was right and made tremendous uh, headway in advancing this issue of slavery. Of course, it didn't go anywhere else in his lifetime, but it, it brought to the national fore here this issue of, of slavery and really set the country up. And unfortunately, John Quincy Adams was well aware that this issue would only ever be ended with a civil war. He didn't want to see that, but he understood that that's exactly what would happen. And he and, and Calhoun had been on, on opposite sides, but they both agreed that the country would was careening towards civil war and that only that would end it. And uh, John Adams, John Quincy Adams spent the rest of his life uh, there as, as a house uh, representative arguing until the day he died for the issues that he thought was right. He, uh, he collapsed in 1848 after, uh, after speaking about not giving uh, pensions to officers who fought in the Mexican War, Mexican-American War. He, he thought, again, that this was uh, an unnecessary war and, and a, an unjust war and thought that Americans shouldn't have done it. He collapsed there on the floor of the House of Representatives and was brought into the, uh, the office of the Speaker and died there two days later. Died... Uh... On the, well, well, collapsed on the, house, on the House floor from a stroke, speaking against uh, issues about the Mexican War. Again, we, part of the opposition, reason for the opposition to the Mexican War was it was, it was simply extend slavery uh, mm -hmm. in, in this country. So again, you see uh, Quincy Adams standing up to abolitionism and the, you know, and, the, and the principle of individual rights. And like you said, he died in 1848. Uh, it's just 12 years later, of course, that Abraham Lincoln uh, is elected president on the on the on the Republican Party, who uh, Lincoln, of course, not an abolitionist yet, although he you know he he becomes one uh, through the course of the war. But the Republican Party stood against the spread of slavery, right? That that was that was part of their stance. They were against the spread of slavery in, into the territories. And it's interesting. I guess we're running out of time, so we we have to sign off. But going back as far as uh, Thomas Jefferson in the early nineteenth century, the slave owner, but a, a theoretical abolitionist, uh, Jefferson was in favor of emancipating the slaves slowly by degree in a way that might be able to avoid the carnage of civil war. You know, and Jefferson prescient on, on, this, on this issue, we can, we can criticize him for a lot about slavery and not freeing his own slaves, even at his death and his relationship with Sally Hemings and, you know, and everything. We can criticize Jefferson a lot, but he's prescient here. Is there some way to avoid civil war over this issue or is it inevitably going to tear the fledgling republic apart. And of course, the Civil War, I mean, was a disaster. More Americans died in that war than any other war, maybe in all other wars combined. I don't remember the exact body count numbers, but it's ghastly. Uh, but yeah, the country's, like you put it nicely, the country's careening towards civil war. And that was tragically the only way to resolve this terrible contradiction on, uh, you know, that plagued the American Republic from its founding. Yeah. And, and, you know, part of Quincy Adams's legacy, we should mention, is that he, he mentored Charles Sumner, who would go on to be a very important abolitionist and very important part of the, of the cause in slavery. And, uh, of course, worked on this issue throughout the Civil War. And, right. Uh, and Sumner, also a congressman from Massachusetts. Right. And, and, and like you said, a, a noted abolitionist. So Quincy Adams uh, uh, cause uh, his efforts in support of, of individual rights and in support of abolitionism bear fruit uh, in 1865 with 17 years after his death with the 13th Amendment, which is good and glorious. Uh, uh, the problem is, of course, it came at such a cost uh, in bloodshed and in, in, in the Civil War. But it was probably the only it was probably inevitable.
given the South's commitment, many, many Southerners, not all, but many Southerners commitment to slavery and Quincy Adams cause, of course, and Frederick Douglass, who we, who we started this show with, uh, you know, uh, three, four weeks ago, uh, their, their cause is, is triumphant. And Lincoln, uh, who, who get, you know, gives his life uh, for this. So uh, tomorrow is John Quincy Adams' birthday. I, I think we should c- celebrate this uh, un- unsung hero of, of abolitionism and of American history. And I think, uh, I, I think that's, that's pretty much a wrap, John. What do, you, what do you think? Yeah, I hope all of you are inspired to live a more heroic life. I know I am. Happy birthday, John Quincy Adams. Happy birthday, John Quincy Adams and John Hersey. May you have a heroic day. You as well, Andrew Bernstein. Thank you, buddy. And we'll be back next week. The Hero Show will be back to celebrate another hero. Uh, our four heroes so far have all been Americans. Maybe we should branch out to heroes from around the world. But we, we, we'll give that some thought. We'll give it some thought. All right. Take care, buddy. Have a great day. You too.